difference. With our goal clearly stated, men and women who have attained a goal of a lively relationship with God is encouragement. Let us now turn our attention to the movements of the human heart with greater precision in its journey to God. Ignatius of Loyola and his rules for spiritual discernment is one of those doctors of the church who can assist us with the task. Timothy Gallagher, um, a novelite, this is the book we will be um, consulting, The Discernments of Spirits, an Ignatian Guide for Everyday Living, will be our text, yes. By understanding the movements of our heart better, so now we're really coming in personally, by dis understanding our movements of the heart, we, I personally, can discern God's will for me, just like Brother Lawrence discerned it for him, with greater ease and confidence. The classics, so here is so here is an excellent summary quote. The classic source is the rules for the discernment of spirits and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Even today, these rules, written 450 years ago, are the church's canonical canonical locus on discernment. And this, here's the, here's the money quote. What Augustine has done for the problem of evil, or St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross for the phenomenology of prayer, St. Ignatius, by the grace of God, has done for the art of discernment. Yeah, I, I, it, I think when you go through it, it is, I mean, it's it's matter, of, like they said, that is capable of, of holding the weight of 450 years of, of intellectual thought and, um, you know, true devotion to the church. But I think that it's had stood the test of time because it's not inaccessible. Sometimes perhaps it's a little challenging to engage with Augustine, right? Sometimes maybe it's a little bit challenging to engage Certainly, with Saint Teresa of Avila and Saint John of the Cross, those are those are a little bit more heady um, texts. But Father Gallagher gives a very good. Um, he he puts these into uh, gives certain images that allow you to be able to to see how this discernment actually looks in the lives of of certain individuals. But I have to say that even if you've ever gone on an Ignatian retreat where you've really just read the words of St. Ignatius, they are not, um, they're profound, but they're not challenging. It's, it's like, it's, it's akin, I think, to reading um, the St. Saint, Saint Teresa's Little Way, right? He, is, he really is speaking to every man, not just to a select few people. So no one should be afraid to pick up this text and really make an engagement with it because it is very, very accessible. Yes, and perhaps some of that comes from his background as a Basque soldier who became a Catholic priest and then the theologian after, a, an, after his mystical experience convinced him he was called to the service. And that was a lot like Augustine, he too, knew, but it wasn't until take and read, take and read right. that mystical experience. Because, uh, and I don't want to discourage people from reading okay. Augustine because his because Augustine, surely many of his, his treatises, for instance, his treatise on, you know, his confessions, his beautiful book of how he came into the church is accessible to, ev to anyone. Um, but it is when he gets into his philosophical discussions that you know, there is an undercurrent that runs very deep in him in terms of just his own classical training and philosophy that, you know, can be a bit heady. But I don't think that that finds its presence here in in St. Ignatius. I really do think that it is an, an open invitation to everyone. I, I agree. I agree. No, I just recalled that I don't, don't quote me, but I... I don't know why, but the number 18, 18 pages, Augustine can wax on about numbers right. and mathematical right. principles right. and all of that reflecting the mind of God. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's heady stuff. It it is. I mean, you can certainly find your way. Like I, I think also the city of God is pretty accessible because it's kind of a question and answer tome, but um, but it's also eight hundred pages. So <laughs> 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 it's not like you're gonna you're gonna pick that one up on a Sunday afternoon and and plow through it. That's right. That's right. Um, in his youth, he was significant significantly influenced by chivalric literature and became a courtier and a soldier, serving in the army until 1521, when he was severely wounded at the Battle of Pamplonia. While convalescing at his father's house, um, and they didn't have the kind of books on military chivalry that he was accustomed to, he was reduced to having to read a book or books about the life of Christ and the lives of the saints. And he was enthralled with what he read. And he started uh, reminiscing about, you know, could he do those deeds? Which is why we put up the lives of holy housewives and um, the saints that go before us. Because that's right. We all wonder, could we do those deeds? So here's a, a small quote. So far, Ignatius had shown none but the ordinary virtues of the Spanish officer. His dangers and sufferings has doubtless done much to purge his soul, but there was no yet idea of remodeling his life on any higher ideals. Then, in order to divert the weary hours of convalescence, he asked for the romances of chivalry, his favorite reading, but there were none in the castle, and instead brought him the lives of Christ and of the saints, and he read them in the same quasi-competitive, competitive spirit. Um, a, we will call it a choleric temper, temperament, with which he read the achievements of knights and warriors. And here's where we all can start thinking. Suppose I were to rival this saint in fasting, that one in endurance, the other in pilgrimages. He would then wander off into thoughts of chivalry and service to fair ladies, especially to one of high rank whose name is unknown. Then all of a sudden he became conscious that after that the after effects of these dreams was to make him dry and dissatisfied, reading just chivalric tales, while the ideas of falling into rank among the saints braced and strengthened him, and here it is, this effective uh, response and left him full of joy and peace. One night as he lay awake pondering these new lights, he saw clearly. So he has some sort of a locution, some sort of mystical experience. And he says this in his autobiography, the image of our lady with the holy child Jesus at whose sight for a notable time, he felt a re reassuring sweetness, which eventually left him with such a loathing of his past sins, and especially of those of the flesh, that every unclean imagination seemed blotted out from his soul. And never again was there the least consent to any carnal thought. And his completion was now complete. After his recovery, he renounced his former life, dedicated himself to poverty and Christian service. And um, the motto, go set the world on fire, was coined by Ignatius. You know, I, I often think about um, just that little detail of the story where, you know, he's, he's injured in battle and he comes back to his father's home. And lo and behold, <laughs> There's no books that he likes to read there. I think, oh, who who made sure that the castle was stripped of of all of the literature that might have been compelling and leaving only a Bible and some stories of the saints, right? I know. <laughs> so I think um, Saint Ignatius may never give credit in his autobiography to his father, but I think that there, I think there might have been a little foresight there I on his behalf. So, but if, and even if there wasn't, you know, as a, as parents, uh, it's a good insight into how to be prudent with our children, right? To remove from them the things that will cause them harm, and to introduce them to things that will that will bring them true joy. And I think that that is the epitome of of Saint Ignatius's father, 
right? He he must have seen some problem, right, developing in the character of his son as a result of this flirtation that he would have had with, you know, inappropriate literature really is what it what it comes down to. And we should have that same care and concern for our own children. I think it, it kind of goes along with them um, in St. Therese's Diary of the Soul, where she makes the point that her her siblings, her sisters, never permitted her to come across any literature that might have hindered her vocation. So, you know, what a what a tender grace that would be to never fall prey to inappropriate literature. And what joy then it it shows can be found in in having recourse to to something that elevates the mind to holy things. I mean, what look at what it did to Saint Augustine. I mean, uh, to well, Saint Augustine too, but I mean, to Saint Ignatius, of course. I mean, so that's exactly right. All right, my friends. Um, in the next episode, we're going to um, turn our attention to Father Gallagher. Till then, fides et ratio. <laughs>